Hello, my name is Jonah Knight. Welcome to Season 2 of Theatrically Speaking, almost a playwriting podcast. Theatrically Speaking is a part of the Actual Story Podcasting Network. Learn about this show over at actualstorypodcasting.com. If you have a playwriting question, if you'd like to suggest a topic, or if you have a play that you would like feedback on, visit actualstorypodcasting.com to send us a message. To kick off Season 2, we are going to prognosticate. Dana Schwartz and Derek Hawk join me to talk about the kinds of plays that theater producers might be looking for as the pandemic restrictions lift and the next full seasons begin to be scheduled. You can find bios and links in our show notes. Hi, I'm Dana Schwartz. I am a playwright living in Los Angeles. I also produce a new play development program with our theater company. The program is called The Mad Lab and it's with Moving Arts Theater Company. My name is Derek Hawk. Uh, I'm a, a playwright and, and run a, a YouTube channel uh, for uh, for theater content. Um, and currently, I'm working on uh, writing uh, one play every month, and then just sitting down and making sure that uh, that I have the the right frame of reference for uh, for what those plays should be. Now that everyone's kind of out of lockdown. Great. Well, thank you both for coming today uh, to to have a conversation about the future of theater. This is going to be very important. Uh, So I guess uh, really what we're talking about, this is kind of a prediction episode. Uh, We're going to try to guess what kinds of plays theater companies are going to be interested in producing. And I think along with that comes what are the plays that audiences are going to leave their houses for? And then is that any different from the plays that writers are going to want to be writing (laughs) after a year, maybe two years of lockdown in some places? Who knows when this will finally be behind us. So I guess, um, Derek, I'll just start with you. Uh, as a writer, are there stories that you think that you're going to be writing or wanting to tell right out of the gate after the pandemic? Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's, that is a good question. So, so my, my usual kind of style of writing, I'm, uh, I do a lot of kind of comedy, uh, a lot of sort of lighter things. Um, so, you know, for the most part, kind of touching on, on, uh, things of, uh, public health and the pandemic, um, you know, I wouldn't do fully, uh, but you know, you can't, I also, if you're writing something in set in the real world, um, you have to now, you now have to make a decision of, am I set before or after, you know, like now you have to, you can't just say set in present day anymore because now the present day has so many different uh, things kind of tied into it, you know? So like, I'll even have to kind of think, okay, um, I will write a play that involves, you know, travel or anything. Well now travel is such a, you know, if is, you know, such a, a fraught idea of, okay, well, if I travel now, that's two weeks that I have to now <laughs> not see my family or whatever, you know, or, or I want to, uh, you know, if I travel to, to this location, you know, are the people there wearing masks? The people are here not wearing masks. So now there's such a, a thing of, of everything so divided and so different that if you want to have that sense of realism, um, you have to, take those into account more than you would before, you know, before, um, my personal style would be just sort of writing, um, just, you know, whatever kind of came to mind, but now I have to kind of think, okay, well, is that going to be realistic now? Is that going to, to make someone now have to think, um, in terms of, you know, how, um, you know, contact points and, and proximity and all these things, um, so that's going to be, you know, for, and then also just thinking in terms of, of making things then easy for the actors too. Okay. I have to take the actors into mind. Do I want them all touching the same thing, you know, 15 times over? Do I want them all being really you know, close together? Do I have to account for, for, uh, their safety as well? Um, so it, it's, it's going to be, be just kind of difficult to kind of thread that, that needle for a while of, of keeping things feeling tied to the real world without, you know, losing that sense of escapism or, or breaking the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the suspension of belief. Right. Dana, how have you been thinking about 
your next few stories. Well, I'm Derek is exactly right. And we now have a line of demarcation, right? So before the pandemic or after the pandemic, as far as when things were set. So the play I was actually working on before all this happened was this sort of dystopian future story about um, reality dating shows. And so now I sort of stepped away from it for the last year because I didn't know I mean, we're living in a dystopian existence. <laughs> so it was really hard for me to kind of wrap my head around, oh, you know, what is that going to mean in a year? What's it going to mean in five years? Um, so I have started um, the play that I'm working on now actually has nothing to do with the pandemic. And I don't know when it's going to be set yet because I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm personally, I'm, I'm a little tired of, uh, of pandemic plays. I'm tired of hearing about COVID. I'm tired of he hearing about lockdown that we spent the last year doing a, a series that was all about being isolated and, and what that was and a comedy about isolation. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm ready to sort of move away from that personally. Uh, but yeah, you either have to set things before or after because during is changing so quickly. It's hard to tell how to do it. Yeah. I think the general sense is that most of us are are fatigued with pandemic stories <laughs> because Completely. we've been living our own. <laughs> uh, so I, it's probably at least an, an easy guess that most theater companies are not going to want to develop their whole first season back around the pandemic, but maybe some elements of it might slip in here and there. Is your sense that, I, well, I guess, first of all, do you both feel the same about that? Or what role do pandemic stories play in the first full seasons back for most theater companies, do you think? I agree. I, I think people are going to want to see something else. And, and in fact, when we sent out our submissions for this year's Mad Lab program, we specifically said no pandemic plays. We want to see stories about Los Angeles, but we don't, we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to, we don't, we want non-pandemic plays. Um, and we got some great submissions and I think that probably most of the programming that we're going to get um, is going to be sort of based like that. I think everybody sort of is just like you said, we've all lived it. So we want to see something new. <laughs> yeah, I think there's going to be, um, you know, there's a bit the people who want to have that escapism um, and maybe just like a, like maybe like a, just a wink and a nod, you know, more than anything. Cause I mean, you still want theater that, that kind of, you know, speaks to, to the truth you know, of existence in, in some way, but it doesn't need to be, you just be a, you know, um, something that, that doesn't, that just kind of, you know, touches on it and moves away. And then you can just can focus on, on more of the, um, something a, a bit more either, you know, outside of, of your current situation. Um, you know, like I had a, a piece I was working on it and, all I did was just have a quick little mention of, Hey, these people were, um, this mentioned somebody was, you know, their job and just a quick, Hey, thanks for, you know, you stepped up when, you know, this whole department was on quarantine and then, you know, so here's a, a bonus for you or whatever, you know, it was a, just like a quick, like a nod, like, okay, this is a thing that happened, but we're here to, to focus on, on, on what theater always focuses on, which is, is like more universal things. It doesn't have to be just tied into the, the one, um, you know, the one experience of the pandemic. We wanted to, to touch on on all the things um, that theater is so 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 good at, at illustrating. Right, and as writers, um, the pandemic is going to sort of sit with us for a long time. And if we can sort of predict that an overt issue play, an overt pandemic play, may not be in demand, um, is the the comparison for me is sort of thinking about 9/11 and here was in the United States this this hugely significant event and a lot of art came out of it and maybe some of those stories disappeared pretty quickly once they were once people started to sort of move away from it and then others sort of stayed around so i guess for both of you how do you vent your pandemic writer's voice knowing that an overt story in this way may not be what people are looking for now? That's a great question. Um, 
and, and I think even, you know, back to, I mean, you can go back to the beginning, right? You can go back to the Black Plague. You can go back to the, you know, the world wars. Because art is determined by what we all are living through, right? And and the, we're the sort of the mirror that we can hold up to be able to wrap our brains around what's happening in this sort of human, you know, this universality. Um, do we owe it as writers to the audience to touch upon it? Or do we owe it to the audience as writers to distract and entertain? And so I think there's a real dichotomy there between what, um, what we want to write and what we should write and what people want to see and to find that balance. I mean, I, I really, I would be hard pressed to want to write as I was hard pressed to want to write a nine 11 play. I would be hard pressed to want to write a pandemic play because my personal experience was, was universal. And so to show something that's unique in that um, for me would be to move away from it. That's just, you know, that's that's how I am sort of <laughs> justifying not writing a pandemic play. Right. Yeah, um, yeah, like I, I sometimes fall into um, you know, one of my kind of uh, um, inspirations when my, my kind of writing heroes is David Mamet. And and he has this belief that theater is not meant to teach so much um, that people don't that people don't come to the theater to to be given a recitation or to be given a history lesson um, per se, people are coming to be to feel things. People are coming to uh, be distracted from what their what their thoughts were before they came into the theater. Like if you can expand them emotionally or give them something you know intellectually stimulating, that's great. But you're not there to say this is what the pandemic was. This is how we lived through it. It's like they already did that. You're your job as a as a as a playwright is to present something again more more of a universal truth, more of of something that um, that just gives them something deeper to hold on to than just information. Mm -hmm. So then, if if this is the way that we assume it is, uh, that the uh, the next couple of years of theater is sort of going to be, you know. Uh, these these issues around the pandemic are going to seep in, uh, but maybe we don't need to. Maybe we don't want to. Maybe the audiences don't want to see. Here is another person's experience in their apartment during the pandemic. What do you think people are going to leave their houses for to go to the theater and see? Especially now that we're at all signs point to being optimistic about our health trajectory. So then what is that first round of plays that gets people out of their houses and they say, well, I might risk it a little bit for this show. What gets people out of their houses now? We've been talking a lot about palate cleansers uh, with my theater company. We're talking about programming and, and what that's going to look like. And, and I would, you know, wh what we're talking about, of course, because uh, this is what we love to do is, uh, is, you know, little dark comedies. Maybe it, maybe it winks at it a little, you know, maybe it acknowledges the existence of it, depending on when these plays are set. Um, but really, really palate cleansers, things that, that are, um, are so far away that are just fun and easy to watch. Uh, something you can sit in the dark with other human beings <laughs> and have that shared experience and, and giggle for an hour or 90 minutes uh, without an intermission. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you just look at the, at the slate of, of the, of the reopenings, you know, on, on Broadway itself, like, like they could have had that the whole, you know, whole year, two years to, to refigure and pick, you know, whatever they could, um, or to, you know, maybe get something, uh, you know, a bit darker or whatever, but everything that's opening up is going to be big showstoppers, you know, big escapist things. Um, you know, they're still doing music, man, they're still doing, you know, uh, uh, you know, six is still reopening on, on West End. So all the big kind of big brassy things. Um, so I think that's kind of, Kind of trickle its way down that that most places when they're reopening, most community theaters, most local theaters, are going to just 
almost be like business as usual. It's going to be, what were we going to put on last year? What do we still have, you know, left to do that we didn't get a chance to do? Let's just, you know, put that back, back in. Let's just start back over from where we were. Um, and, and, you know, I think it'll probably be almost two or three cycles until we start to really see um, anything creep in of, okay, now let's kind of reflect back on, um, on what happened, what we lost, what was before. Um, I think it's going to be more of almost like starting, starting at, back at square one um, with, with what, what we already had on the books. And, and it'll, I think it'll be a while. Like really, I would say like until come from away, there wasn't really a nine 11 super centric big hit play. You know, I, I would say that that was that kind of the one that I would say is the really kind of, reach back so it's going to take a while before we start to see kind of more popular stuff really start to approach what this was um because if you see any of the movies that came out about pandemics they weren't good <laughs> so <laughs> any of the pandemic movies uh set inside were not good so i think i think we're going to want to take a step back and and really have a chance to reflect before they start putting pen to paper um, you want to see outbreak the musical there yeah I, I don't i'm actually <laughs> I, actually i i, would. I totally want to see <laughs> yeah. that yeah. i want to see i want to see them do like a like a uh a, a, a kong style puppet for the for the, the right? rabies monkeys, for the you know? monkey i love it <laughs> um i agree with that but i would also uh go a step further and say that i think big theaters are going to program um that way, big splashy, big, you know, brassy 11 o'clock number musicals. Um, I think smaller theaters are going, have been so hit so hard financially by this um, all over the country, but especially New York and LA. I know that, that people who make their living this way have been suffering and that there are now these beautiful performing arts grants that are out there available in the world. And so I think that people are going to, in the smaller theaters at least, are going to program around what's going to pull an audience in. And I think that um, one of the most interesting parts of this is going to be uh, what those algorithms look like, how to, what people want to see in this, these first plays and these first experiences that are programmed are really going to be a litmus test for what this next season looks like, especially for smaller theaters. Um, because, you know, if you do a drama and nobody shows up, then you have to, I think, pivot and, and vice versa, you know, maybe people don't want to come and, and laugh, or, you know, maybe people aren't ready to come see a frothy comedy about, you know, I don't know, uh, nuns or whatever it is. I don't know why I just pulled that out, but anyway. Um, and, but I think that that, I think listening to the audience is going to be critical for this, especially for this first season. Well, thank you both for coming on and and talking about this. I think it's something that's sort of front of mind for a lot of writers and just theater people in general and audiences. Like, what am I about to see? What what's what's going to happen? So, if anyone wants to get in touch with you or see what you're up to, where can they find you online, uh, Derek? Uh, well, uh, follow me on uh, my Twitter account, which is a. Uh underscore Derek writes underscore so I put the underscore on both sides there which is a, a, a probably a, something that, that does not usually happen so <laughs> put that two underscores uh and then uh anything else um i will all will all be kind of available to my website uh it's going to be uh, born a playwright.com uh that's where i'm going to be uh you know i'll have my own work up on there i'll have um links to all my youtube videos will be up there um and any sort of instructional things um will be uh, available there as well uh, and a storefront and all those lovely things um you can just kind of link to from there all one-stop shopping great um and i am you can follow me on twitter if you'd like it's always fascinating it's dana schwartz 29 and um then the theater company where I work is called Moving Arts and it's movingarts.org. And on there are links to watch our uh, Isolation Inn, which was our pandemic series. If you're in the mood for a little, uh, a little COVID comedy. Great. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Every day. Our theme song is Candy, licensed from the band Ketza. Ketza Music 
www.actualstorypodcast.com. Additional information can be found in our show notes and over at actualstorypodcasting.com. Thank you again, and we'll see you next week.